Good morning. Good to see all of you at Emma Grove Baptist Church this morning. Seems like it's been a while, does it not? But it is indeed good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 90, to the 90th Psalm. I'm going to finish up this study of the oldest of the Psalms, and this Psalm, again, is written by Moses, and so there is much wisdom and in, wisdom to gain through this psalm as we allow the Spirit of God to lead us and to guide us in this truth. Psalm 90 and verses 13 through 17 are where we're going to give our attention this morning. Psalm of Moses, I will begin reading in verse 13. Do return, O Lord, how long will it be? And be sorry for your servants. O oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to your children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of your hands. Yes, confirm the work of your hands. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this privilege, for this opportunity that is ours to come in this house of worship this morning and to worship you in spirit and truth. That is what we seek to do. But God, in order to do that, we must be led by your Holy Spirit, God. And so we ask that first of all, you would forgive us for our sins, that you would cleanse us, that your presence might be made known here in a great and mighty way this morning, God. And that we would live and move and have our being in you to, do, to seek to do it without you is to not live life at all. I just pray for this service. I pray for this time. I pray for us that you would help us and that we would grow in you in grace and sanctification and mercy. You are the God of mercy. And I thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And that is the title of this morning's sermon, Praise the God of Mercy, of course, many attributes of God, but where would we be without mercy this morning? And certainly he has shown that to us. A nun who worked for a local home health care agency was out making her rounds when she ran out of gas. Sounds a lot like my father. You ever seen him on the side of the road? I know some of you have. As luck would have it, there was a station just down the street. She walked to the station to borrow a can with enough gas to start the car and drive to the station for a fill-up. The attendant regretfully told her that the only can he owned had just been loaned out, but if she would care to wait, he was sure it would be back shortly. Since the nun was on her way to see a patient, she decided not to wait, and she walked back to her car. After looking through her car for something to carry to the station to fill with gas, she spotted a bedpan that she was going to take to the patient. Always resourceful, she carried it to the station. She filled it with gasoline, and she carried it back to the car. As she was pouring the gas into the tank of her car, two men walked by. One of them turned to the other and said, Now that's faith. In order to see God, you have to have faith, don't you? You have to come with, with faith. And where does faith come from? How do you have the ability to know God, to feel God, to walk with God? Christianity is a faith-based economy. And because of the God of mercy, because of His grace, He has enabled me now to have faith. And so I grow in faith as I understand His mercies more and more every day in this Christian life. This walk begins and ends, simply put, with faith. But in order to have faith, we can't get away from the mercy of God either. Amen? He is a God full of mercy, compassion, and grace always accompanies mercy. So as we talk about mercy, never forget about grace either. The two go hand in hand. That is the God that we serve this morning. This is the fourth and final stanza of a prayer for the Lord's mercy, His hesed, His unfailing love and covenant faithfulness. The text is peppered with strong and passionate requests of Yahweh from Moses that you would act according to your loyal kindness and goodness and faithfulness for God is faithful, is he not? 
He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In order to live the Christian life, we have to depend not on our own faithfulness, but on His. In order to arrive and to achieve the calling of God in my life, I must walk in His faithfulness. He is faithful. He is so loyal. And He is merciful. We should long for His mercy. The people of Israel would understand that God is a God of mercy. Their sin... certainly caused them much grief. And they were punished. But God did not need to condemn the people of Israel. The people of Israel condemned themselves. For us today, sin is is punished. But God does not need to condemn me or to punish me. I condemn myself. And I suffer the ravaging consequences of my own sin. We must say this, and this is proper and pure theology. It is never God's fault. Amen? But it is always my fault. And in order to get where I need to go in terms of this calling, I must understand that first and foremost. I am depraved. I am wicked. I missed the mark, Hamartia. I did it, but God will help me get out. But never understand this, and God will never help you with this attitude. God didn't put you there. And there are tests and trials, and those are different. But we have this escape goat mentality. In our society, no one takes accountability for anything. Who did it? I don't know. I didn't do it. And nobody out there did it. It just happened somehow. As fate would have it, it, it just happened. Somehow it just happened, but it is our fault. We missed the mark, and so we should come to God, and we should long for his mercy. I hope you're ready to wake up this morning, amen. I'm ready to wake up, and I'm ready to start the day with the Lord our God, who is the God of mercy. If it weren't for his mercy, none of us would be here this morning, amen. Mercy, mercy, do return, O Lord. How long will it be and be sorry for your servants? Oh, satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Verse 15, make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. This call for mercy. Sometimes God's people can be overwhelmed with their sin and God's judgment at the same time, but understand that God disciplines those whom he loves in this case, does he not? And so he punishes for a reason that they would return, and apart from his grace we have no hope, no future. Moses thus asked the Lord to return and delay no longer, but to return with compassion for those who serve him. Our sin deserves punishment and wrath. Only his kindness and compassion can deliver us from what we deserve and his kindness and compassion are found alone in him who is Jesus Christ there is kindness and compassion available in him God's only son building on God's compassion we can request his mercy or his unfailing love God is a lover of the human soul what a word love What an abused word. We toss it around so lightly, don't we? I love that football team. I love my stuff. I love that person. But God really loves us. He is the lover of the human soul, not what you see, but what is in here, amen. God has a desperate love for mankind to know him this morning. The unfathomable riches of the love that God has for man, things in which even angels long to look into. The love that God has for mankind. And Moses understands that this God is a God of love. We're punished. Yes, we're in sin. Yes, it seems like we're being chastised. Yes, but it is all for our good because understand this, God loves us. And our understanding is totally skewed, but his is inscrutable, amen. Who is the question, the God of mercy, who is only seeking to turn us in a way that we would further glorify his name? For if I continue in my sin, it will destroy me. Do not let me continue, O God, but turn me out and turn me around according to your mercy. There's a triple blessing In regards to God's unfailing love, there is satisfaction, there is rejoicing, and there is gladness. Such joy and gladness and satisfaction will accompany us 
all our days, even in those days where the Lord has afflicted us and we have seen evil, our souls, understand this, can only truly be satisfied in the Lord. We can only truly rejoice in the Lord. I can only be glad in the Lord. Satisfaction, joy, and gladness, these three, understand this, are never found anywhere in society. These three alone are found in God. And so in the endless search to find these things in this society, understand this, it's just that it's endless, it's never ending. You will not be accompanied with these things by this society, but you'll be accompanied with these things as you trust in this very same God. Moses cries out for the mercy of God as we cry out for the mercy of God. Amen. Send your mercy, O God. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? We should look for his glory in verse 16. Notice this as we move along. He says this, Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. Philippians 1.6 says this, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. Perhaps as Paul is writing, he is drawing on Psalm 90.16. That which is done for self will, pe will perish, but that which is done by God in us will last and reveal the glory of God in and through and to his children. His work of salvation, sanctification, and glorification will redound to his praise and glory, not ours. And so we think about this verse 16. Let your work appear to your servants and your majesty to their children. God, let me see your hand. Let me see your movement. Let me see your spirit because it's altogether entirely different when it comes about. Amen. And there's a lot of churches listening to me this morning. They're going to church, but they're really not going to praise God. Amen. They're really not going to worship God. They're really not going to experience God. But I praise God for this reality this morning. I believe that we're in the presence of God. You know, a lot of times, God is in your presence, but you have no idea that God is in your presence. It's not that God's not there. It's that your eyes aren't opened. Because of the God of this world, he has blinded you to the truth, to the reality, to the light, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you believe that God is here this morning? Do you believe that? I'm telling you what, that's a lot of the battle right there. If you don't believe that God is present, if you believe, well, this is just something cultural, it's inherited, this is part of what I do on Sundays, if you believe that reality, then you're not going to know God this morning. You're not going to experience God. But if you believe that he is present, amen, this can be different. This can be different. I mean, I, I'm not a preacher because I inherited it. I'm a preacher because God called me. You're not saved because your parents are saved or your grandparents are saved. You're saved because God called you by his grace and his mercy, amen, and you responded in faith to the call. A different type of Christianity and a different type of God than some of us are accustomed to. He is not the God of the West. He is not the God of South Georgia. He is the God of the world, amen. He's the God of the universe, and that is the very same God of the Bible. And never forget this, he's also the God of mercy. For I understand this, what I should be getting is not this. Neither should you. What I deserve is hell and punishment and judgment. I know who I am, and you know who you are. And deep down, I'm just going to tell you this, man. It's ugly. It's nasty. It's dirty. You have no idea. And in regards to yourself, neither does anyone else. It's not bad. It's really, really bad. Thanks be to God this morning for loving us so much that he would send his one and only Son, Jesus Christ. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The reality of mankind, of humanity, we love to emphasize this progressive utopia and the goodness of people and the way that we can just press and, and push and create a better society in and of ourselves. Folks, that is not possible. That is not possible. The only good thing is God. The only one that is good is God. 
And I am good when I'm found to be walking in Him, but that is the only good thing. Praise God for His mercy. Praise God that we can know Him in this way, that He has ransomed us, that He has rescued us, that, but God saw me in my sin and He did something about it and He pardoned me in the one that is Jesus Christ. He took it for me. God has saved me from that life, and I no longer find meaning in that way of life. In fact, it has now become to me to be miserable. It is rocks in my mouth. It is mud in my mouth. It tastes disgusting. I don't want it anymore. I want something else. I want the God of mercy. The God of mercy can change you this morning. You know that, amen? Give you a whole new life, a whole fresh start. This is good news. This is the gospel. The gospel is everywhere in the Bible. It will be God's best life now and forever. Now that is a life worth living. Oh, to see the works of God and his glory put on display rather than our iniquities and our secret sins. That is a picture I will gladly go and see. In fact, we should beg the question, when can I go and see it? To live in my iniquities and my secret sins? Or to go and see this very God that offers me something that none the world can? Let me gladly run and see what this is about. We are here on this earth to know God intimately, fully, correctly, and contagiously. To house His holy person in our bodies, allowing Him to showcase to the world around us His loving nature, His attitude, His thoughts, His emotions, and His actions through the way we live every moment of our lives, says Eric Ludy. What's so interesting and perplexing is, you know how God very often seeks to do this? He does this through people, does He not? He pours forth His Spirit in this way. And I've got something to showcase this morning, I really do, and you do too. I've got something to showcase But it's not me, and it's not you. You don't have something to showcase in yourself, but you've got something inside of you if you've been born again, amen. You've got something to showcase, and it is the hope of glory inside of you. It is the person of Jesus Christ inside of you, amen. If you've been born again, he's there. You've got something that they need. Colossians 3.3 says this, For you died, and your life is no longer your own. Now it is hidden with Christ and God. And so it's no longer I that live, but it is He that lives through me if I'm going to be satisfied. Amen. If I'm going to do what I'm supposed to. You see, the old me died at 21, and someone else came to live in me, and I want to let Him lead the way, and I want to do this with that old person. I want to constantly kill that person. Amen. I want to bury that person. And I never want that person to come back. I want the newness of the relationship with God and Jesus Christ to be the forefront of everything that I am and have seen about me. We should live for His beauty, verse 17. The beauty of God. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and confirm for us the work of our hands. Yes, confirm The work of our hands. Verse 17 builds on verse 16. His works, his glory, his beauty, his works are made visible in our works. The text calls it the work of our hands. Beauty could be rendered favor. Life lived only under the sun may be vanity, as Ecclesiastes would say. Life lived under the lordship of God, of Jesus Christ, has purpose and meaning in contrast to what Solomon was speaking of. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, says the preacher. It is meaningless. These pursuits are endless, and yet they profit you nothing. But God offers you something altogether entirely different, does he not? He offers you purpose. He offers you hope in his mercy. Amazingly, what is temporal can become eternal when it is established by God. The will of God. What he can take and make strong, make the finite everlasting and the fleeting lasting. Do you want a life that will count and count for eternity? Here it is for the taking. Go for it. Do you know what I'm speaking of? A life that truly matters is a life lived for Him. Amen? A lot of folks go through the motions. They never met the God of mercy. Listen to this illustration. Jimmy Johnson, when coaching on the college level, had a wife and the appearance of a marriage. 
because that's what people expected of college coaches. The wife and family was needed for social occasions, but the day he was named head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, you know what he did? He set about to get rid of his wife because his wife was no longer needed. All he needed was the appearance of a wife. You know, so many people use God that very same way, do they not? Man, I, I, I'm in the church, I, I've got a relationship with God, but as soon as you feel like you've profited from God or, or from the church or, or from appearance what you need, you know what you do with God? You get rid of Him. Or maybe you have a relationship with God and God helps you and He, and he answers your prayer and He does all these different things for you. And yet when He gets you there, you know what you often do? You discard of God, don't you? I'm telling you, the one that gets neglected the most is God, is he not? He, he is a good God. Jimmy Johnson had the appearance of a beautiful relationship, but he didn't have one. And you know what? I think it's true also in the church. I think there's a lot of folks that have the appearance of a beautiful relationship, but the reality is they don't have one. Imagine people going to work day after day without knowing their company's business, yet that's exactly what happens when church members don't know what their church is trying to do. Fanaticism consists in redoubling your efforts when you have forgotten your aim. What is your aim? Do you know why you're here? Do you know what you're doing? Do you know where you're going? What is real and is beautiful, and it doesn't get more real than this, the relationship with God that I have done what I've done, but I'm not going to be punished for what I've done, but that he has forgiven me and his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. The reality, you've heard it 10,000 times, but has it ever really sunk in? Ask yourself the question, so familiar with the message, but do you really understand the message, amen? Has the message grabbed a hold of your life? Has it changed your heart? Regardless of what you've done, where you've gone, what you've participated in, you can be forgiven this morning, amen? And I want to end with an illustration of this God of mercy. This God of mercy. And I pray that you would just listen to this. And our instrumentalists are going to come and we're going to have this invitation. But won't you listen to this? I believe the Spirit of God is speaking this morning. He's moving. He wants you. You know, I remember one time I was driving down the road and I punched the steering wheel. This was at a time in my life when I was very frustrated. And I really didn't understand what I was doing or what God even wanted from me. But I punched the steering wheel. I just said, God, what do you want from me? You know what he said? Two words, your soul. You know what God wants from you this morning? Your soul. You say he already has it. Yeah, you might be born again. But you know what God wants? He wants all of it. He wants all of you. And know this or not, this morning, know this, this is the absolute truth of the Word of God. You want all of Him. Some of you just don't understand that. You say, no, I don't. I don't want all of Him. Yeah, you do. Because if you want satisfaction, if you want peace, if you want joy, if you want happiness, if you want meaning in your life, then know this, you want all of Him. Amen. You really do. Satan confuses things for you and you don't really know how to show your emotions and to really say what you think. But really deep down, you want all of him. This God of mercy. You say, you don't know what I've done, but God does. And he chooses to forgive you nonetheless in Jesus Christ. There was a little boy visiting his grandparents on their farm. He was given a slingshot to play with out in the woods. He practiced in the woods, but he could never hit the target. Never hit it. Getting a little discouraged, he headed back for dinner. As he was walking back, he saw Grandma's pet duck. Uh-oh. Just out of impulse, he let the slingshot fly, hit the duck square in the head, and he killed the duck. 
He was shocked and grieved in a panic. He hid the dead duck in the wood pile only to see his sister watching. Sister's name, Sally. She saw it all, but she said nothing. After lunch the next day, Grandma said, Sally, wash the dishes. But Sally said, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen. Mm. Then she whispered to him, remember the duck? So Johnny did the dishes. Later that day, Grandpa asked if the children wanted to go fishing, and Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. Sally just smiled and said, well, that's all right, because Johnny told me he wanted to help. She whispered again, remember the duck? So Sally went fishing and Johnny stayed to help. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, he couldn't take it any longer. He came to his grandma and he confessed, I killed the duck. Now listen to this and hear what I'm saying. Grandma knelt down and gave him a hug and said, sweetheart, I know. You see, I was standing at the window. And I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, and now you've come to tell me the truth, I forgive you. I was just wondering how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. God is just wondering how long you're going to let sin make a slave of you this morning. And he's wondering when you're going to step up and let it all go. You know that? He's waiting on you. He's waiting for you. It's on you now. The ball's in your court. Whatever is in your past, whatever you've done, the devil keeps throwing it up in your face. Lying, cheating, sexual morality, profanity, bad habits, hatred, anger, bitterness, whatever it is, you need to know that there is a God that is standing at the window and he's seen absolutely everything, but he still says this, just come. And let me forgive you. And I'll give you a whole new life fresh start right here in this moment he has seen your whole life he wants you to know though that he loves you and will forgive you if you come in truth and faithfulness he's just wondering how long you will let the devil make a slave of you and know this if the sun sets you free you'll be free indeed this morning there's an offer in regards to this God he is offering you his son to take your place and to set you free. Will you let him do it? In this invitation, I'm going to ask you to stand. And if God is speaking to your heart, won't you come? And won't you let him do what only he can?